framed by the high mountains of the Hindu Kush, Kabul was once a key stop on the silk routes of Asia, a place of gardens, bazaars and grand palaces. Today, sadly, it's known for very different reasons as one of the most dangerous cities on earth. For the RAF helicopter crews who fly over it daily, it's somewhere to cross quickly. The rear crewmen scanning the streets below, the pumas firing off decoy flares to ward off potential ground threats. We're flying from Kabul's international airport to a heavily fortified compound in the heart of the city. It's home to troops from five nations, part of what's known as the Kabul Security Force, or KSF. Their main job is providing security, acting as guardian angels to NATO advisers as they travel throughout the city. And among them is a company of soldiers from 2nd Battalion, the Yorkshire Regiment, here on what the British Army calls Operation Torrell. In recent months, this city has seen a spike in violence. The Taliban, a now Islamic State's Afghan franchise known as ISIS Khorasan Province or ISIS K, have launched a series of high profile suicide bombings and gun attacks. Securing the city is now the job of Afghan security forces, with NATO providing advice and mentoring. And in charge of the KSF is a British brigadier. We've had these recent attacks. There is a, a ring of steel essentially around the city, but somehow these insurgents are managing to get these, these bombs, these vehicle bomb and IEDs into the, into the city. How, how good a security force are they? How effective are they really on the ground? I think if you look at the performance of the Afghan security forces across the country, we should be very impressed. I am very impressed by what they're doing. There is no doubt that security in the city is challenging. Um, the Afghans have stepped up to the mark in the recent weeks, and I think what they're delivering now is very capable security against a very difficult task of securing a big city um, from all directions. They are there at the front edge. They are putting themselves in danger every single day, and they're doing it stoically. I mean, it's very, very impressive, and in many regards, you know, we are humbled by their contribution to our own safety. So I think they're brave warriors, and they're doing a very good job. 650 British personnel are now based in Afghanistan. Here in the capital are Alma Company, Two Yorks. As well as patrolling, they also provide a quick reaction force. And in January, when Taliban gunmen attacked Kabul's Intercontinental Hotel, killing 43 people, they helped evacuate guests to safety. We essentially, when it, when it uh, first started, we, we went in and we got all the information that we could. And um, we, we sat back as we, we let the Afghan forces take, take, uh, take the lead uh, and they, they went through and did, did all their stuff. And then we, we essentially sat back and then when they needed us, we, we would move forward and we were there to extract um, civilians from the hotel area and take, move them out back into safety. Today we're joining Alma Company as they cross the city to meet Afghan forces at a key checkpoint, one of the city gates that encircle Kabul. Insurgent groups are believed to have suicide bombers on standby in this city, looking for opportunist targets. It means road moves like this can only be carried out in protected vehicles like the Foxhound. The, over the bridge. At a checkpoint on the southern edge of the city, we meet some of the local officers whose job it is to stop those insurgents getting in. Here too, Turkish troops mentoring the police. For the Yorks, this is a chance to identify possible bypass routes, ways the insurgents might be getting around this ring of security to smuggle in explosives and bomb components. Just outside the compound is the gate itself. Here, police officers stop and search vehicles as they enter the city, a task that in Kabul can literally mean life or death. Absolutely. Every, every second of every day they are uh, checking vehicles, which could be, uh, could be bombs, could be explosives, uh, and if they identify uh, those vehicles, then there is a very good chance they're going to go off. And yet they're still getting out day in, day, in, uh, day out, uh, checking those vehicles with, with uh, a level of bravery that I am genuinely impressed with. One of the young officers here is Charlie Dennison. He only joined the army six months ago, and today is his first ever operational patrol. Uh, so I'm from a military background anyway, so my, my dad's been out uh, during the Herrick eras and then uh, I've come out, uh, missed the Herrick eras obviously, but it's a good experience to be out here, uh, learning the ropes, seeing how uh, the Afghan forces are taking over uh, that mantle from us. The Foxhound vehicles the Yorks are using were designed specifically for Afghanistan. They're V-shaped hulls offering improved resistance to IED blasts. And back at Nukable Compound, they're maintained by a team of Remy engineers. Uh, yes, so the... Foxhound comes with a pod in the chassis, the pod being for survivability for the crew. Uh, the pod is also interchangeable between vehicles, so you can take it off and uh, attach it to another vehicle. The Foxhound crews are kept busy, as we see firsthand for ourselves. 
While we're filming, a report comes in about yet another bombing close to the base, and the York's quick reaction force gets ready to move out. They've just been scrambled because a suicide bomber has just detonated a device about a, a mile or so away from here outside the NATO headquarters. Now they are here staying put for the time being because all the roads in the city, in this area at least, are closed uh, while the Afghans deal with the incident. In the end, the QRF are stood down, the aftermath dealt with by the Afghans themselves. Yet another suicide bomber has attempted to prevent peace in this country. It later emerges the bomber struck at a checkpoint while a number of top officials and military commanders were inside NATO HQ holding a press conference. Among them, General John Nicholson, America's most senior officer here. Two members of the Afghan security forces are killed in the blast and a few hours later, ISIS-K claim responsibility. NATO commanders estimate there are 1,500 ISIS fighters now in Afghanistan, the vast majority Pakistani Pashtun, many of them defectors from the Taliban. Given we've been here a long time now, is this still a winnable battle, a winnable war? Yeah, we've made great progress across the country. The Afghan security forces are at the heart of the solution to the security situation here. And the quality of their soldiers, the quality of their policemen is shining through across the country. And we should take great heart that they are winning this fight. And I think they will win it. Uh, I have no question that they'll win it. And they're getting closer to doing so. But they are still taking huge numbers of casualties. Uh, well, it goes back to the point about their bravery. They are on the front line every day. They're taking the fight to the enemy. And sadly, many of the individuals who are out there are wounded or killed in the action. Um, that's a fact of life, but it is a reflection on their quality uh, in winning this fight. Uh, once they leave that location, I'll let you know. During our time here, 23 Afghan soldiers were killed in one day across the country. The turf war between ISIS-K and the Taliban has spilled onto the capital streets. Everyone in Kabul on high alert for another attack. Our trip to one of the city's famous landmarks, Flag Hill, called off because of fears for our safety. For British forces, the mission to bring peace to Afghanistan has been long and hard, but one in which they're still very much involved and, say, commanders will see through to the end. If this country is to one day find peace and security, then these men and women, say military commanders, hold the key. On the western outskirts of Kabul, in a sprawling training area, is the Afghan equivalent of the British Army's Royal Military Academy. Built with £75 million of UK money, it aims to train the leaders this army will need to defeat Afghanistan's long and deadly insurgency. On the parade square, they practice their drill. The marching may look more Soviet than Sandhurst, but everything on the curriculum here is modelled on UK military training, albeit with an Afghan flavour. British troops don't teach here, they mentor the instructors. This academy, very much a work in progress. The Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst is over 200 years old. It didn't just happen overnight. This academy started from literally nothing, bare earth, and in less than five years has produced over 3,000 officers, uh, over 100 females, two have won the Sword of Honour. And so the, there is already a lot of progress made. We, are we at a stage where we can step back and let them do it on their own? No, we're not. Um, some areas are much more advanced than others, but that institutional resilience, the, the things that will hold it all together, that make the academy resilient from internal and external influence, that allow it to uh, continue to develop and be robust for the future, is what we are really focusing on at the moment. The cadets are drawn from across Afghanistan's 34 provinces and from all its ethnic groups. Teaching them are 180 Afghan instructors. They in turn are supported by 64 international advisers, around half of them British. Among them is Captain Lawrence Ainsworth, who mentors four instructors. They're all very friendly. Um, the ones who speak English are always keen to speak English with you. And the ones who don't kind of try and grab your attention, in particular when we're outside in the field exercises, and you can chat to them through your interpreter. Having spoken to a few of them, they're all very similar reasons why we join the army, if not uh, even more magnified here. They want to defend their country and they want a strong and stable Afghanistan that will enable their families and themselves to have a prosperous future and a safe future. To gain a place at the academy, cadets undergo a two-day selection board with as many as 700 applicants chasing 320 places. This Afghan captain 
is a veteran of combat with the Taliban. And in 2014, he was selected to attend Sandhurst. He told me Afghanistan's security is a regional problem. Do you think you can defeat the Taliban, ISIS-K, Haqqani Network, the, the, the terrorists that uh, you have to, to have to fight here? So this, uh, uh, in the same time, this is not the Afghan war. So, so we, can, we, can, we can mention this is the war of the regional uh, powers. So I can mention China, I can mention India, Pakistan, I can mention Iran. So it will take the time. But it will take time, but uh, basically it's uh, important to Afghans to work hard in the army and keep their security in the future. The training area covers 2,000 acres, with cadets broken up into platoon-sized groups. They spend a year at the academy, field training like this, the largest part of the curriculum. These young officers are in their junior term. They're learning the basics of being a soldier, things like patrolling, weapons handling and digging defensive positions. Each year the academy trains around a thousand officer cadets, of whom around 10% are now women. Just over 100 female cadets are currently in training, the highest number since the academy opened. 90% are from one ethnic group, Hazara, from the highlands of Afghanistan. And to try and attract more women, female cadets receive more than double the training pay of their male counterparts. So we're currently working to push for mixed lessons. Obviously there's a couple of cultural issues, so some of the lessons that's combat life support, so if we're doing breathing, um, we separate them into the tole, so we work with a bit of both, but primarily we're working on mixed lessons. These cadets are joining a military that suffered heavy losses. In the first four months of last year, two and a half thousand Afghan soldiers and police were killed. A further 4,000 were injured. In 2016, nearly 7,000 members of the Afghan security forces lost their lives in just 10 months. And last summer, the Afghan government stopped releasing casualty figures. So I'm an ex-military policewoman. Major Cheryl Richards so yeah, mentors the officers who design the training courses here. Officer. What do you think about them as people in terms of their bravery and commitment to go and do what, they, what they're going to do? I'm, I'm in awe of them, really. I think um, from all of the Afghans I've worked with, they're all pretty motivated to make their country a better place. Um, and actually, they're, they're keen to get on with that. Um, and, and actually they're looking towards a time when, when the mentors are no longer there and they can actually run with things themselves and there's that sense of um, wanting more independence and wanting to just get on with that. So I really respect them for that. Although infrequent insider attacks are an ever-present danger and all the mentors have their own guardian angels, in our case Australian soldiers, keeping watch at all times. Advisors, including the British troops, are housed in a separate base on the edge of the site known as Camp Carga. In here is a company of soldiers from 2nd Battalion, the Yorkshire Regiment, QRF one, two. some of whom are on standby 24-7 as Carga's quick reaction force. So when we're in the hut, we're on uh, five minutes notice to move. Um, so when we hear any sort of alarm go off, uh, we don hack it, um, depending on what the incident is. It might be an in-camp incident, so we react to that however we need to, whether it's a fire or if it's out in the city. Um, we'll mount up in the vehicles, get the vehicles into order of march and get ready to step off out into the city. While it still takes its fundamentals from the British Army, the Academy's rather outgrown the tied nickname Sandhurst in the Sand. The leadership uh, training that's being developed here and delivered to the cadets is starting to bear fruit and hopefully, and this is the intent, is that will last long into the future. This is, this is about growing the leadership of the army, not for the next two to three years, but for the next 20 to 30, 40 years. While it still models itself on Sandhurst, the realistic aim is for ANOA to be on par with academies in India and Pakistan. Long term, the plan is for a gradual drawdown of NATO mentors here, with them all gone by 2026, leaving behind its hopes a first-class training academy able to produce the leaders this army and Afghanistan so badly need. Simon Newton, Forces News, Kabul.